Hi, so today we have the second part of the Renault Zoe Power Electronic. This is the BCB or battery charger block. Thanks very much to Richard in Northern Ireland who um, got this to me. He also uh, sent a few of the, uh, the cables as well so we can have a look in the um, connectors are quite uh, complicated in themselves. The inverter teardown I did recently has details of how the whole charge inverter system works so I'm not going to repeat that, just go and watch that video. There's a diagram showing um, the various components of that to show sort of what's basically in this box. So this this is the um, main sort of input power controller that forms part of the charge circuitry alongside the um, motor windings and the devices in the PEB. I don't know whether the devices in the PEB actually form an active part of any of the controller, whether they're just turned on to provide a current path through the motors of the battery. If anyone knows, please leave it in the comments. We've got the mains input here. I don't know whether this is a 22 or a 43 kilowatt unit and I don't know what the differences are between those units. Again, if anyone knows, please leave it in the comments. So we have the mains, uh, four connections in here, three phases plus neutral. On this side, this is an output for the air conditioning compressor, a couple of low level signal connections. And down here, we've got a couple of coolant ports for the uh, base plates or the semiconductors for the charging circuitry are obviously mounted on that base plate with this liquid cooling. Interesting, the, um, these uh, seem to be a much larger hose than, the, than we saw on the PEB, but that I, I wonder if maybe it actually uses a different um, cooling circuit, possibly even with passive uh, flow because it's. Uh, this is obviously only running when the, um, the, the car's charging and there aren't really going to be any other serious heat sources so um, perhaps either it's a passive flow or maybe just a small you know, low flow rate pump to um, do the cooling on this. And on this side we've got um, various high voltage connectors. This one comes from the battery. This one's for a uh, cabin heater. Um, this is the power feed out to the PEB, the inverter stuff and DC-DC converter. And this is the centre tap connection for the motor. This is effectively the output of the um, charge control that goes through the motor, which acts as an inductor. Um, and then via the PEB into the uh, battery. So opening the first cover, there's not a huge amount to see yet. Um, all these connectors here are the interlock pins for the various high voltage connectors. These all sort of go down to one uh, loom that disappears down down here somewhere. Um, there's a sort of plastic support that holds lots together. There's a big encased unit there. I think that might be an inductor. One of the little detail is they've actually got an interlocked interlock switch on the cover. So they're quite serious about their, all their various um, safety interlocks on this thing. So taking this mounting plate out we can see a little bit more. There's a, some sort of little electronics box here. You can see this capacitor that's three 100 microfarad caps. That's probably the input capacitor that we saw on the, um, the patent drawing. And I think this is an inductor here which is connected I think in series with the, the motor common connector. On the side here we've got a little cover which again has a, an interlock connection. And there's a couple of fuses in here, and these are the fuses for the air conditioning compressor and the heater outputs. A fuse for positive and a fuse for negative, and they then connect to both of the um, outputs. Also, this is so that they can run more sensible size cabling to those devices, because there's yeah, avoiding the potential for umpteen hundred amps from the battery going through that um, lower power wiring. These are 40 amp rated at um, 450 volts DC, glass case with um, a ceramic filling. So these are sort of fairly high rupture capacity, but they're behind a sort of metal panel inside a, a plastic case. So it doesn't matter too much if these were to disintegrate if they blew. And the wiring for these is pretty straightforward. We've got the uh, high voltage input. This goes to the battery um, input bus bar into the fuse holder. And then we've got two cables coming out, one this side going to the air conditioning compressor and the other one here coming off the same terminals onto the um, onto the heater connection so there's a separate fuse for positive and negative but they're both connected together obviously this isn't something they didn't normally expect to blow in normal service although a, a, something like a stalled air, air conditioning compressor might perhaps pull uh, 40 amps and blow the fuse actually these terminals have got quite a nice little captive nut detail so you've got this sort of fairly tall nut that actually held in place by um, tabs on the side of the tags. Obviously this makes it a lot less fiddly when you're doing assembly trying to get this into a sort of fairly confined space. I've just taken all these connectors off get, to get a bit of space. The, the high power ones have these um, large sort of screw lug type terminals. You've got the interlock pins here and the smaller ones look like they're just creating the actual terminals and these are quite small. 
and these look like they're just crimped in and you think all the cables have this um, braided sleeving on the ends actually look like they're tape rather than heat shrink they're uh, all fairly well made obviously they've all got their own little part number label so there's quite a lot of uh, a hell of a lot of wire just cable assembly in, uh, in this thing now for some reason this separate bit where the um, charge port connects is actually a different module if you sort of hinge this up we see there's like a sort of center part of the case and this is actually a separate module so I wonder if maybe this is the part that's different between the 22 and the uh, 43 kilowatt versions and here we can see just this is, this is like a bus bar assembly that connects the input and output battery connectors together so I've separated these now there's this block here um, I'm fairly sure this is what uh, is referred to as a filter module so I'm guessing there's RFI filters I think there's also some re a relay for configuring between single and three phase operation and I have heard of quite a few reports of these sort of having some problems and failing so I think maybe this is a bit of a weak point in the system um, you've got three phase outputs and neutral outputs and a shielded um, signals connector and in here we've got a capacitor block this is three times 100 microfarads 230 volts rms 63 amp ripple current so i'm guessing that's well that's probably gonna be partly emc filtering may also be power factor correction um there's a block here there's probably like a um the power semiconductors on the bottom of this and a control module there's um this looks like a flex rigid i don't see the pcb cur curving off the edge there so that's probably a multi-board sort of folded up flex rigid assembly and there's this large inductor here marked um 93 micro is 165 amps and this thing is really heavy it's weighed it's just over a little bit over eight kilos this inductor uh, there's this little um, device here connecting one of the battery terminals to the chassis so i'm sure that's going to be an emc filtering device it's a bit of a weird form factor so measure, measuring it it looks, it looks like it's two um 22 nanofarad capacitors wide in series so um not quite sure why they wired it like that unless it's maybe an existing component they use somewhere else that they're just reusing for the same um, same purpose uh, there's a little base plate temperature sensor here and then we've actually got the power semiconductor block here some uh, heat sink goop unlike the inverter this is just sort of st stuck to the bottom with the uh, water flowing underneath it they haven't done anything uh, exotic like have the uh, blaze plate here so this is running at significantly lower power levels and the uh, motor inverter and this is the underside where the water flow goes so you can see uh, this is where all the cooling's focused by that semiconductor module there's not really much else um, the inductors there the capacitors there but i doubt if they produce uh, any significant amount of heat so this is the uh, power semiconductor block so we've got sort of electronics drive module on the top and um, the actual power module on the bottom this actually unplugs so we've got um, this board, this is all conformal coated. So this is this control assembly, which is on a uh, flex rigid PCB assembly. So that just folds up. It means you can get lots of these um, interboard connections without having a connector on it. Just basically it's like a flexible layer on the PCB, all laminated into um, a single board. So we've got um, Infineon Tricore main processor here. This is just a power supply chip. That's a switching regulator with that does loads of other supply rails to supply this and various other things on the board there's an actel pro asic cpld which i'm guessing that's probably providing some of the uh, low level waveform generation just mostly passes on this uh, connector board uh, this is a vnh 5050 h bridge and i think the um the charge socket on this has got a motorized locking mechanism so that when you plug it in it locks the connector in so that's probably to drive that some line drivers some can bus transceivers some sort of looks like RC filtering. This connector is mostly the interlocks from the various connectors. Interesting, this one, both the boards and the cable assemblies have Lear on them, so it looks like these are made by this company and not Continental, which you saw on all the uh, the motor stuff. Um, these two connectors plug down into um, these connectors on the power module, and this little one goes down to this little PCB here, which I'm sure is going to be a, um, a current sensor which will be measuring the um, the current into the battery, I think. And this is a little current sensor module. Interesting, it's not using Hall Effect. It's actually a um, conventional shunt. Um, this device is uh, an isolate, which includes a built-in 
isolated DC to DC converter so all this stuff is going to be an amplifier plus um, A to D converter that then sends a digital signal through this isolation barrier so unlike on the um, inverter module this is actually quite easy to unsolder because the holes are quite sort of oversized and the pins are long enough that there's no major thermal issues if we flip this over we can see these are three dual um, isolated IGBT drivers these have an internal isolation barrier drive within the same chip these A-pin chips are just some transistor arrays. This is a switch mode controller that's supplying the drive for these. These will be transformers for the isolated power supply for the, um, the high voltage side. So that's sort of fairly straightforward. So it's just a IGBT, IGBT um, driver array, unusual package. You've got some gaps there for um, clearance. Here's the power semiconductor block. We've got a metal, presumably shielding plate here. And there's a plastic cover hopefully this isn't potted yes okay all right so again we've, we can see a very similar construction to the uh, device we saw in the inverter let's see if we can figure out um, what these devices are okay these modules seem fairly straightforward we've got this little temperature sensor here we've got so each of these three sections is an H bridge and we have two parallel devices each side we've got a diode here which tells us a diode because there's only two connections to it obviously you've got multiple bond wires but there's only two terminals and we have the igbt here i, I did a quick test and they it drops about 0.8 volts across the diode and 0.8 across the igbt when it's turned on and it looks like there's an additional diode here connected across the emitter and collector of the uh, igbt um, we've got two, we've got a, a reference and a gate drive for each one here and then one here. And if we look at the drawing from the patent, it corresponds fairly closely. We've got the diodes, the IGBTs. Incidentally, I've seen one or two references to thyristors in here, but I think that was just someone misinterpreting the little squiggly lines by the diodes as uh, gates for thyristors. These are just a diode IGBT combination. The current sensor board that we saw will be this uh, device marked A. Um, in the top right and that 93 microhenry inductor goes in series with the output of that one interesting thing is that the diode 13 shown in this drawing does not actually appear to be present at all in this unit but I suspect the combination of the, those series diodes and probably the diodes across the IGBTs probably actually perform that function so maybe they figured out that uh, adding that extra diode didn't actually make a great deal of difference but um, that diode is definitely not present in this unit anywhere this is the filter block, so we've got the uh, mains input here, this is going to be the single or three phase mains. got a signal connector with a nice shielded um, cable bundle with a ferrite core on it. And we've got the outputs, there's three phase outputs and a neutral output. The neutral output is only, only goes to the capacitor block, so it's just a pure three phase input to the child circuitry. And so from what I've read I believe there's a relay in here which switches the input depending whether the input is, is single phase or three phase it switches the neutral onto one of the phases in the case of a single phase supply because of the issues of the motor being used as part of the charge circuitry it's quite fussy about earthing so it does a an earth loop impedance measurement between earth and neutral to um, try and verify that the earth connection is good before it starts charging so that's got to be in here and also there's probably going to be some um, emc filtering and so on now my first thought of seeing inside this is what the hell is going on here? We've got you know, loads of capacitors as we'd expect from filters, some inductors here, but we've also got six relays and these are like five amp relays so these aren't carrying the main current. So what on earth are these relays doing in this silt unit? There's also um, a board here that seems to have quite a lot on it so um, let's start pulling this apart and figure out what on earth is going on in this box. So I've got this first board out. This actually, although there's a lot on it, it looks like it probably isn't very complicated. There's only a six-pin control connector on here, and I suspect it's basically three fairly identical circuits. We've got these large 10 microfarad, 300 volt capacitors, um, some power resistors, these three inductors. But it looks to me like there's a lot of duplications. I think I'll uh, see if I can trace the circuitry out on that to see if I can figure out what it's doing. It could be that it's reconfiguring the filter depending whether it's um, single or three phase perhaps. Looks like there's a little bodge. That looks like it's just a discharge. It's a 4.7 meg resistor across one of these uh, caps. That's probably just providing some um, discharge for those caps. Now this bottom unit 
it seems to be mostly inductors. We've got sort of three big inductors here, and one I can just see from the side, there's some sort of massive windings on, but I'm trying to figure out how this thing goes together. And this whole, whole assembly, in theory, lifts out of the metal can. The problem is, these cables sort of go into this connector and into this unit, so I think this must have been assembled and then these clicked into this connector because I can't see how else it could possibly come apart. So let's see if I can get these. Um... Right, I've now got this pretty much apart. If you carefully unthread all the connectors and everything, you can actually get this board out. This is an assembly of uh, three PCBs. Um, I think these probably are clicked into the connector, but I couldn't easily get them out. I gave up sort of trying to unclick them, so I just end up just chopping the cables. In fact, the, these do actually uh, unclick if you uh, release the barb from the front, but it's quite tricky to do all of them because you need to sort of unclick them all without any of them clicking back because the button, because they're so short and so thick. It's it was turned out to be too fiddly. So uh, as I'm not planning on reassembling this, so I wasn't too bothered about just uh, using a bit of uh, applied chopping. Then we have this assembly, which now comes out, which is a somewhat massive filter. Some additional inductors here and connections up to that board with all the relays on it so I'll, I think I'll trace out how this all connects and try and figure out what it's doing and this section here there's three thin cables going into this posit area so I'm pretty certain these are going to be um, current transformers for measuring the input current these come directly from the um, charge socket so these are just AC uh, current transformers now these inductors, they look like they're laminated, so they're probably quite high, sort of low frequency, fairly high inductance, but there is also a connection to, the f to both sides, there's like an extra connection to the output side of it as well, which goes back to the, uh, on those PCBs. And just when I thought I got it all out, I noticed this extra bit down here. And first thing that looks weird is just this board that's just got a capacitor on it, which looks almost like it was an afterthought or a fairly late design change, or they just couldn't get all the capacitors in this in this other sort of electronic package. Then underneath we have what looks like a current sensing resistor. Um, this company uh, is a Bell and Hooter specialise in. Uh, precision low value resistors for current sensing and this is actually this is the incoming earth connection from the charge socket and this connection is the chassis ground it looks like they're actually measuring to detect any current flowing in the earth connection which would indicate a fault particularly for example a uh, fault between the motor windings and the, the case but any other earth fault um, this whole thing just does look a little bit elaborate though um, for something it's just a current shunt the sort of this clamped assembly here sort of the copper through the middle. R003 suggests 3 milliohms, but there's this flex. I'm not sure if that's just sort of two current sense terminals or whether maybe there's a, um, a hall sensor or something. So I'll take this apart and have a quick look. Also, there's a lot of electronics here, I and mean, this all looks like analog stuff. But for a board which is presumably just doing current sensing, there seems to be an awful lot of electronics on there. I don't understand why there'll be that much. Uh, there's five twisted pairs going back to the um, PCB. You know, the slightly unusual thing is the circuitry on here. So we've got the, we're ta there's a connection tapping off that input earth before it goes through the current shield. Going through this capacitor, there's a direct connection to one connector on the board, but it also goes through capacitor um, onto another connection of the PCB. So unless it's maybe this is actually measuring to make sure that this earth connection hasn't gone open circuit for example if this bolts come loose or something but that is rather odd now, the construction of this uh, center resistor is quite strange it's sort of the actual element is clamped between these two aluminium plates and then we've got this flex PCB that provides sort of connections to each of the end terminals I can only assume this is to avoid any sort of thermal gradients or sort of thermal changes on here, but for something which is just sensing, yeah, if looking for any ground current, it does seem um, somewhat overkill. 
So the you know the complexity of this current sense board really is a little bit puzzling. I've only had a very brief look at the circuitry, but um, one thing I've noticed: the in, this is the input across the um, the sense terminals, and this is actually split into two separate paths, and it goes into two separate differential amplifier paths. The first is pretty much what you'd expect. This is an LTC 2050, which is an ultra low input offset amplifier. Now you'd pretty much expect that because you're only dealing with very low input voltages and there seems to be two stages of this so presumably that's doing sort of the, the low the um the low level sensing but it also goes through here this is actually a high speed quad op amp 12 megahertz bandwidth and actually quite an expensive one so i can only assume they're also measuring sort of high frequency noise on the earth path as well as the um the low level voltage um i've not really traced it any further than that it's a four layer board and yeah, I'm sure it's probably just going to be sort of stuff like filters and so on. But I'm just sort of rather surprised at how complicated yeah, this is for what should be a fairly basic function. So these are the three PCBs section at the side. Uh, this is the most straightforward. This is like PCB pre-charge. And there's two relays on here, um, just the coil connections. And basically these two pins, one is connected to the L3 three-phase input, one is connected to the neutral. So this is the relay that connects when it's being charged single phase. It connects the neutral to the L3 phase to provide those the two phases into the bridge for the charging. and. This is sort of a fairly typical two-stage relay board that you see when you're charging loads that have a capacitor on there. Because we saw we've got this massive 100 microfarad capacitor on the input. So if you connect that straight onto the mains, then you potentially get quite quite high impulse current that could potentially um, damage relay contacts. So what they do is there's three 33 ohm resistors in parallel here. So what happens is it will turn this relay on first, which will connect the uh, L3 to neutral via that, that 10 ohm resistor which reduces any inrush current into the um, capacitor and it'll turn this relay, relay on secondly which will just connect them directly together. Now they're connecting those phase pins directly together they're not switching the L3 between the incoming L3 and neutral because if they did that they'd then need a, uh, a changeover relay rated at 63 amps. Now I'm told there is an issue uh, with the Zoe in that there are certain charge point faults. If you've got a charge point where one of the phases isn't connected because, you know, because of a fault what can happen is that it actually connects the neutral and a f and a l and an active phase together. I'm not quite sure. You know, I would have thought it would, it would sense L3 before connecting it, but apparently, um, apparently this is a fault that has been reported where it will actually connect the neutral to a phase, trip a circuit breaker out at the charge point, but also weld together the contacts of the relay. It means it would then have trouble um, single phase charging again, and there have been one or two reports of that. Perhaps I'm wondering maybe it's logic in determining whether it's single single or three phase. You know, is it actually measuring everything? or other, other circumstances where it can think it's single phase where actually there is a, um, some voltage on that uh, third phase. I don't really know if anyone's got any information on that then again please leave it in the uh, comments. Uh, these relays are Panasonic 21003W rated at uh, 48 amps 250 volts. The, um, I believe the single phase charging on the Zoe is 32 amps so um, those are sort of 50% overrated. So uh, just out of curiosity, I did pull this relay apart. And unfortunately, I didn't get it, get it on camera. But these contacts were actually welded completely solid in the closed position. It took a lot of effort to actually separate them. So you know, this unit has clearly had that fault occur, occur where it's connected the phase directly to the neutral and um, caused a bit of mayhem. If you look at the inside of the relay case, you can see where sort of some of the there's some definite signs of sort of flash burns and particles of the metal from the contact in there and you can actually see the the contact is in sort of very uh, poor condition so this unit has actually suffered that exact fault so the moral of this is if you've got a Zoe that's had a, that has any sort of charging problem or unknown get a multimeter and just measure between L3 and neutral on the charge port and just make sure there's no short circuit through the relay otherwise um, you're going to have a bit of a bad day you know the the re yeah, the relay it means the relay is already dead, but at least it means you're not going to blow out another charge port um, because of it. And if you look at this other relay here, this is the one that goes through the resistor for the pre-charging. You can see the contacts on that. There's a little sort of, there's a little sign of burn on there, but nothing uh, too significant. 
you know, these are still operating, but say these ones were actually welded completely closed like that, and it took quite a hefty sort of push to actually get them get them apart. So these were definitely, you know, permanently shorted. Now this board I think is to do with sort of just general sensing and measuring and pr probably also to do, um, has a role in the earth loop impedance testing. Um, we've got connections on here for the all the input, or basically all the charge connector pins. We've got the three phases, neutral and a chassis ground to the chassis of the um, module. Uh, these three I'm fairly sure are transformers used for measuring the supply voltage on each phase. Uh, we've got a bunch of sort of series parallel resistors here so this is almost certainly going to be some sort of high voltage resistor divider. Got a little, little opto isolator here. We've got two relays here so my guess is these are to configure it to do the um, earth loop impedance measurement. Just mostly uh, analog stuff on here. And lastly this is the control board. There's um, actually a pick on it. It's a DS pick 33 FJ128 GP706A, which has a couple of CAN interfaces on board, not surprisingly. Got the CAN transceivers here and some transformers, some power supply stuff, a bit of analog stuff, op amps, and interestingly, an RS232 transceiver and an RJ11 port. So this thing actually has an RS232 port on it, which is quite interesting. And we do get a little bit of startup text out of that serial port. Got um, input module rev two eight two four, and then shortly later config from primary EEPROM. That's it. Now that will be that when this thing's running and you plug in, you get some more status information. But um, that's all I'm getting at the moment. And there's this little five pin um, SOT twenty three device. Couple of two two K two resistors. So I'm pretty sure that's going to be an I squared C E squared prom. And if we look at the I squared C bus, you see these are these two serial uh, data bus at the top. And we can see it's reading all the I squared C data from the E prom, then outputting that message about uh, reading its parameters. Nothing of any obvious interest in the data itself. Just a load of numerical values. No idea. No real way of knowing what they uh, actually mean. And that serial port doesn't doesn't go anywhere else. External to this board, because the these are the uh, two pins, and those aren't populated in the cables. So that's clearly just for debugging. The RJ11 is actually for picking circuit programming. I, I assumed it was serial because it was next to the transceiver, but it's not connected. This is just the uh, standard pick um, in-system programming interface. Also, they conveniently provide an ISP port. It'll be rude not to try reading it. Uh, there's about 8k of code in there, a few bits of text that I've just stripped out here, nothing super interesting. Looks like there might be some sort of like sort of very low level monitor functionality in there, but nothing uh, that looks particularly uh, interesting. Okay, I've traced out the circuitry on that um, large board with all the capacitors and relays. I'm fairly sure this is uh, correct. So it looks like those relays were to do with reconfiguring the filter, presumably between single and three phase modes. Where the relays are numbered one, two, three, those are the coil circuits. So both those ones operate together, two together, etc. And each of those relays had two contacts wide in series. So each switch on this diagram represents two series connected contacts, presumably for protection against the um, contact sticking. So at the front end, you can see there's some transorbs connect common up to a um, gas discharge tube uh, for transient protection and then we've got these uh, the, the 1.7 millihenry inductors are these very large toroids the 100 microhenries are these PCB mounted ones that have a ferrite like material as the core and the 86 microhenries are these very large ones which had a um, a flat sort of laminated steel type core so although the inductances look measure very similar they're clearly sort of rather different um, devices in terms of their characteristics. Uh, I've, for clarity I've omitted all the discharge resistors and I've c conflated multiple components into one. So for example the 11 ohms on the neutral relay is actually 333 ohms in parallel and these the 1.35 ohm resistors are actually a pair of 2.7 ohm 5 watt resistors in parallel. And in fact they do actually have temperature sensing on those as well so they do expect them to run uh, run hot. But um, I can't say I completely understand all this, I'm sure yeah, and if anyone knows more about power electronics and can figure out how this is supposed to work and what the reasoning is behind the switching then uh, please leave it in the comments. 
Um, I've had a bit more look at the um, that measurement board. I don't really have time to trace it all out. I'm sure you could probably figure out quite a lot by tracing the signals, but um, I think that that circuitry, that individual capacitor on that board with the earth amplifier, I think that may be to do with injecting an AC signal for measuring ground loop impedance because there's a pair of high voltage MPN transistors on that board. And I think that can probably inject a signal via that uh, 220 and enough capacitor um, to then measure the, um, the earth impedance somehow. So let's just take a quick look at these cables. This is the um, cable that goes to the motor. So this is the motor end, three windings plus the center tap. And then this end goes to the PEB the inverter. And this one goes onto the BCB for the uh, charging connection. You see, these are the interlock, interlock connections. They're not sort of terminatable cables here. They're just a link. So it just connects across the two pins in the uh, connector. And they've got sort of fairly, all got fairly elaborate latching mechanisms. So this one, Sort of plugs on to the PEB connector, and then this lever that sort of that, that provides sort of the main insertion force to latch it in, and then there's an additional latch here, which I think that pulls out. And I think on this one there is um these usually have a secondary latch just once it's closed, but I think this one might have a part missing or be broken because it doesn't actually appear to latch. I think this is meant to sort of prevent this unlatching but it doesn't seem to but I say this may be uh, what may be damaged and so these ones have got sort of fairly fat blade connectors with a shield around each one and there's some sort of multi-point contacts in there and this thing that this is just a single pole version of effectively the same connector and this the latching thing on this does actually seem to work the, the these connectors are all quite fid fiddly if you don't know the the, the um the technique they are actually really fiddly to um plug and unplug but once you figure out how the latches work they're a bit easier so if this one plugs in latch is closed and then this pushes in and this then prevents this being pulled out because that's what actually latches it so if you pull that out you can then lift this this piece here which unlatches off of here and then that, that allows you to um, take it off. Obviously these are designed to be fairly vibration resistant. And the other ones use similar uh, principles. So this one, this is one for the air conditioning compressor. It's a much sort of smaller low capacity um, connector. Again, it latches in. Most of them use this sort of peg on the side that goes into a sort of latching mechanism. So that, in this case, this sleeve slides in and out. So as you push it in, that, pulls it in through that cam and then actually locks it down and then again you've got this blue but to provide some initial additional locking which locks that cam so there's no way that can come out so to take this out you have to take take that off and there's actually two separate press releases that are actually marked sort of press one press two so you sort of need to press that one get it out part of the way then press the second one and give it a bit of a wiggle and it does actually unplug and the other style of these these used for the battery dc connection where you've got a circular co connector with obviously multiple contacts and again there's um, multiple sort of latches that you need to be aware of and this one again is slightly different there's a sort of slide for locking on this so this goes in and then you slide that down and it pulls it in there's a click there and there's also again this uh, um, a lock to prevent that coming off this one's actually got i think one of the latches actually snapped off of this so uh, wouldn't be surprised to find a few of these sort of damaged by people that don't can not figured out how to actually take them off but so once you've got the knack there they're not too bad but i'd imagine in a sort of car engine bay they're probably still uh, a bit a bit faff obviously they've got very heavy um they've got sort of very heavy cables on them so they're, they're all sort of quite difficult to handle and pulling this one apart you can see how it's constructed you've got the uh, multi-point contact in there this was this is crimped it was using um a hydraulic crimp tool with a huge amount of force onto the cable there and the i think this shielding shell is also crimped on and there's an insulating sort of space that goes on there shielding can on top of that and then goes into the this shell then there's the retainer with the seal this sort of clicks in and locates the uh, contact in the right place and these ones are a little bit different the shield sort of seems to be just crimped in place with a sort of steel cable tie onto the can 
the construction looks a little bit more complicated um, I can't really be bothered to take this completely apart to see, figure out exactly how, how it all works these I think all these connectors are made by FCI but I can't find any info online I'd so I think there's actually quite interesting there's all sorts of um, stuff going on here nice sort of custom bus bar assemblies and I think it's quite satisfying we actually found you know, the actual fault on this unit uh, but it was this um, charging issue now I think you know the overall idea of this charging system using the motor although it's quite clever I think it's probably a bit sort of past its sell by date now because I think when this was originally released maybe they didn't really know what direction charging infra infrastructure was going in and so do 43 kilowatts AC is pretty much a dead duck nowadays as um, it's not really being supported by any new chargers or any new cars and it's now that rapid charger infrastructure is sort of much better it's questionable whether it's worth the you know the cost and the weight and the space of even a 22 kilowatt charger on board the car i think you know the onboard charger on the car is valuable for home charging which would typically be seven kilowatt single phase 11 kilowatt three phase and that's partly dependent on which country you're in because some countries have lower current three phase supplies as standard to, to the home uh, and others have high current single phase and all this business about switching over between the single and three phase i think certainly at least one chart system i know actually has three separate 16 amp input chargers and those are used and those are combined in different ways so for three phase all three all three are used one on each phase and for single phase 32 amp charging they wire two in parallel so you get the seven kilowatt single phase 11, 11 kilowatt three phase without too much um, additional hardware i've not seen inside enough chargers to know how others handle it but that seems a fairly reasonable approach to minimize the amount of um, switching and filtering and so on so yeah this is a lot of the weight and size of this thing was just all the MC filtering and dealing with the um, single versus three phase switching which maybe you know adds enough complexity that the, that basic idea of using the motor as part of the charge system is maybe not such a big advantage when you have to have all these additional complications plus all the issues around earth testing and yeah zoe's are notoriously fussy about charge points yeah it may be a, a good idea originally yeah i think maybe uh, not so much nowadays and certainly the new zoe's have ccs dc charging because the, the nice thing about dc charging on a ccs thing is that all the electronics and the consistication is in the charger not the car so in terms of what's in the car all you've got is basically some protocol control and a relay that just connects the charge port straight across the battery and then the, the uh, rapid charger handles everything else for you but uh, so i think yeah this it this is uh, has got some quite interesting engineering in it i'm still keen to sort of have a look at any other ev power electronics uh, i've got at least one onboard charger on its way to me at some point and if anyone has any in more insight about the zoe one in particular like the um what charger fault actually causes it to go into this destructive relay welding situation and whether there's actually any fix for that and also whether the later zoe's are significantly different um, and also I'd be quite interested to know what, what the actual difference is between the 43 and 32 kilowatt units in terms of yeah, what hardware differences there are or whether it's even just a software change. So um, please leave it in the comments.